We're live on Facebook. <clears throat> it's going to work today. All righty, everybody. Welcome to today's presentation of Happiness Isn't Brain Surgery with Doc Snipes. Practical tools to improve your quality of life. Today, we're going to be talking about a book called 365 Days of Happiness. Now, you know, we've been talking about my book that's coming out, 101 Practical Tools to Defeat Depression, and my approach is largely very cognitive. So some of the things that we're going to talk, we've talked about are going to apply in this book as well. Um, Jacqueline Pirtle covers a lot of concepts that are common to my book, but she has a different approach. And, you know, not everybody walks to the beat of the same drummer or marches to the beat of the same drummer. So... Let's just take a look at this. So her book, 365 Days of Happiness, um, is written in a format that's a daily non-sequential meditation or action strategy. So each day you read a page, and most of her pages are like half a page or three quarters of a page, um, kind of like your daily meditation books. And she helps you get into the framework, into the mindset of a positive frame of mind for that day. A lot of the suggestions and the um, tone of the presentation is very creative and sort of new agey, which works really well for a lot of people. If you've, you're familiar with Sark's books at all, and we're going to talk about those a little bit later, um, that's kind of the approach that Jacqueline Pirtle takes. So if those work for you, then great. This is going to be an awesome resource. Now, the difficulty of this book to implement her suggestions and everything, I call it easy-ish. It's easy if you're willing to do the work. If you're not willing to do the work, then it ain't going to be easy. So, you know, take it as it comes. Now, one of the cool things about this book is the age appropriateness because the activities she suggests, since they're broken down into one-day little snippets, <clears throat> can also often be broken down and taught to our children. So things that she asks you to do on a particular day, you can share with your kids and help them develop an attitude of happiness. Now, the drawbacks to this book, and the only real drawback that I see, um, is that it's really not trauma-informed. There are a few entries that, if you've got a trauma history, might make you kind of bristle, um, and that's okay. You know, just recognizing that if you like the rest of the book, you can embrace it. And then those parts of the book that feel um, not validating, you can choose to skip over. I mean, it's not going to make or break anything since this is a non-sequential implementation. And what I mean by non-sequential is you can start with day one and work all the way through, or you can start from from day one and then skip to day 271 and then back to day 36, whatever makes you happy. Um, and sometimes with non-sequential books like this, I'll do that. I'll just pick it up and I'll open the book to a page and whatever page it lands on is the page that's appropriate for that day for me. So let's talk about some of the concepts, and we're going to go over 40 of the concepts that she talks about in her book. Obviously, there's 365 days, so there's 365 activities. Now, she does repeat some of the concepts, like mindfulness, multiple times throughout the year, but she gives you different activities to use to implement it. So the first concept that she presents is having a high-for-life attitude, and Getting excited about the wonder of now. Getting excited about the fact that it is a glorious day outside. It was kind of cool the other day. We had a cool front come through. And I think it was only about 82 degrees outside. And I just almost couldn't stand to be inside. It was so glorious outside. And those are the types of high for life moments that you want to hang on to and go, how can I recreate that 
all the time. The next thing that she talks about is mindfulness. And you want to be mindful of how you're feeling and what you're needing. But you also want to be mindful of the happy in your life. We, as humans, are kind of plagued, if you will, by something called the negativity bias, which is the way our amygdala, part of our brain, is programmed to protect us. So humans tend to pay more attention to negative things and give more weight to negative things. So if you're having, you know, a day and half the things you see are positive and half the things you see are negative, because those negative things are weighted heavier, you're still going to have probably a negative experience or attitude for the day. The, the best ratio they found to help increase happiness is five to one. So for every negative experience you have, you want to try to search your memory banks for five positive experiences you had that day. So it's a five to one ratio. And that will help you reprogram the negativity bias. It won't do everything. This is one of those things that you've really got to work on. But when we get stressed out when we experience a threat or something negative our brain is activated as what and parts of our brain called the amygdala are also activated so you have your cognitive aspects and then you have your emotional protective aspects well the brain defers to the amygdala the emotional protective aspects and we need to teach it to you know consult that cognitive area a little bit more Connectedness is another thing that she talks about a lot. And you know, all of these things that we've talked about over the past few weeks. Making sure that you remember that you matter. And looking at your impact on things. Looking back at the things that you've done and the ripple effect that it's had. You know, if you smile at somebody in the morning, maybe that gives them hope th that morning. And then they smile at somebody else and they smile at somebody else. You know, how awesome is that? Think about things that you've done in your life, you know, positive contributions that you've made in someone else's life that have helped them make con positive contributions in other people's lives. So you do matter and you do have an impact and it's this ripple impact. A fourth topic that she talks about is radical acceptance. And you know, we've talked about radical acceptance in terms of accepting it is what it is. However you feel right now in the moment, whatever's going on right now in the moment is what it is. Now, you can choose to improve the next moment, but what's, what is right now is what it is. And there's no sense fighting with it or saying it shouldn't be like that. Instead of saying it shouldn't be like that, say it is right, like this right now. How can I improve the next moment? Happiness triggers are something that we talked about a lot when we talked about environmental interventions for depression. But happiness triggers help you energize your space. Add happy mojo to your space. I actually have a cat that I named Mojo for that very reason. Uh, but add things in your environment that help you feel happy, that help you feel light, that help you feel energized. If your room is painted in all dark colors and you've always got the blinds drawn and, you know, there's very little light, you know, that's going to be a very oppressive space for most people. So think about how to energize your space. Recognize and embrace freedom of choice. You have the right to choose, and you have the ability to choose how you interpret situations, how you feel, what you do, who you associate with. You do have the ability to choose. Now, all choices have consequences that go with them. Don't get me wrong. But you can choose to fight with a feeling and stay struggle, struggling with it, or you can choose to improve the next moment. However you feel right now is what it is, but you can choose what to do from there. So recognizing and embracing that you've got a choice. You had a choice to get out of bed this morning. And, you know, hopefully you did eventually. It's Sunday, I know. The seventh concept that she talks about is embracing yourself, imperfections and all. And when I work with clients a lot of times, I start out talking about people that they love and their best friends and, you know, yada, yada. Are, tell me about those people. Are they perfect? Well, probably not. You know, we all have imperfections. But I want to hear that. And it's like, okay, this person's lovable and this person's a good friend, even though they're not perfect, even though they let me down sometimes, even though whatever. Okay, now let's turn that back around on yourself. 
embrace yourself, recognizing all the wonderful, awesome things about you and the fact that, yeah, you've got some imperfections. You can't do everything and be everything to everyone all the time. That's just the way it is. It's human. So embracing yourself for all your imperfections. The eighth concept that she talks about is opposite emotions. And this is a dialectical behavior therapy concept that, you know, we've talked about before. When you're feeling angry, when you're feeling stressed, when you're feeling some unpleasant emotion, you can't feel that way and feel a happy emotion at the same time. So one thing you can do when you're feeling that way and you're just feeling awful is find something that will put you in the opposite emotion mind space, whether it's silly cat videos or putting on your favorite music really, really loud or playing with your kid or whatever it is. But having a list of things that can elicit that opposite emotion, which is some form of happiness or elation. The ninth concept is knowing your destination. And we talk, we've talked about this before as having, a, having an idea about what is a rich and meaningful life for you. You know, in order to be happy, that's great. But what is happiness for you? How are you going to know when you're happy? A lot of people keep striving to feel better or to feel happy. And they keep looking for this thing out there. And they're missing the fact that in a lot of ways, they're happy right now. So what is your destination? What does happiness or a rich and meaningful life look like for you? What parts of it do you have right now? And what parts of it do you need to work toward? That way you can choose how to spend your energy. You can choose to spend your energy on other stuff, or you can choose to spend your energy in a way that helps you move towards that destination. Number 10 and number 11, I'm going to cover them both kind of together because they go together. Spread happiness and compassion. When you help make someone else happy, it's going to have reverberating effects you know even if it's just a little thing you know it will probably have effects on the way they interact with other people throughout the day or how they're thinking or whatever the same thing is true with compassion you know sometimes we can be happy and we can help people see the happy and sometimes we can just be compassionate and help people see that you know what this is a time to embrace someone and recognize that they're doing the best they can with the tools they have at this point in time, whether that's the person that is, you know, holding up the line in front of you or, you know, your significant other who didn't follow through with something they were supposed to do or whatever. Taking a breath and reminding yourself that most of the time, now I'm not going to say this is all the time, but most of the time, people are doing the best they can do with the tools they have at that given time. So being compassionate and going, all right, how can I approach this differently? Number 12 is answer the miracle question. If you woke up tomorrow and you were happy, what would be different? Number 13 is act as if and embrace adjectives. And these are a couple different activities that she had, but they're both, both kind of the same. Act as if you're already happy. You already woke up and everything was great and you are a happy person. Just try acting that way for a day or two days and see how it affects your energy, your space, those around you. Going along with that, you can embrace adjectives. You can wake up one morning, and this is a fun one to do with kids, and identify an adjective that's going to describe you all day long, whether it's compassionate or silly or intellectual or whatever it is that you want to exude for the rest of the day and then just focus on being that adjective um you know every once in a while i will have one of those days where i just tell myself you know what today we're going to embrace happy go lucky and that's the way it is uh, number 14 and we've already talked about this one a little improve the next moment right now might be unpleasant it might really suck so what can you do to improve the next moment my best friend's going through some stuff right now and, you know, life is really kind of throwing him a bunch of curveballs and it's frustrating and exhausting and just sometimes demoralizing in the, in the things that he's having to deal with. But, you know, he could sit at home and feel sorry for himself, but he chose not to. 
you know, when I talked to him this morning, he said, you know what? Last week was just miserable, but I chose to spend the day with my kids. So they're on their way over. And his kids are teenagers. So, you know, getting teenagers to spend time with you can be a challenge in and of itself. But instead of dwelling on the misery, he chose to improve the next moment because what's part of his rich and meaningful life is being close with his sons. Guided imagery. That's another great thing that you can use. And it's part of distress tolerance skills from dialectical behavior therapy. But closing your eyes and imagining your happy place, imagining what it would be like to be happy. And you can imagine your interactions with people. You can imagine going through an entire day without anything that makes you unhappy. You can imagine your favorite vacation place that when you go there mentally, it's just extremely relaxing. Whatever it is, but you want to make sure you really delve into it. You know, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What's different? How do you feel? Number 16 is head, heart, and gut honesty. And we talk about this a lot. In order to be happy, you need to be honest with yourself about what you need, what you want, and what you have. But in order to do that, in order to be honest with yourself, because a lot of us have learned to lie to ourselves or suppress our feelings or suppress our wants, we need to be mindful of what our head is saying. You know, is it the right thing to do? Is this the logical thing to do? What our heart is saying. What is it that we want? What would make us feel fulfilled and happy? And what is our gut saying about it? Because the gut's the one that goes, yeah, guys, I don't think that's such a good idea. Well, if your gut's on board and your head and your heart are in line, then you're probably doing something that is helpful for you and help, helping you move towards a rich and meaningful life. And get out of your comfort zone. Now, this one, you're like, to be happy, I like my comfort zone. Well, I like my comfort zone too. But every once in a while, you can get out of your comfort zone and try things that might make you even happier. Like when I learned to rock climb or when I went snorkeling in, in the Caribbean. Or, you know, there are a lot of different things that you can try that maybe you're a little in, um, apprehensive about trying. And you try them and you're like, oh, that was awesome. I want to do that again. I'm glad I had that experience. So get out of your comfort zone and try a few new things. Go sing karaoke. Take a line dancing class. Whatever it is that you think might help you or might be a fun activity that might, might add happiness to your life. Number 18 is get inspired. You know, we can go through the day just kind of trudging along and running on autopilot. But if you look around, you can get inspired. You can get inspired by how a little tiny seed, like a mustard seed or an oregano seed, I mean, they're very, very tiny, can turn into huge plants. You can get inspired by watching how hard a little squirrel works to get food um, or how smart a crow works. You can get inspired by people around you and how they're pulling through things, even though, you know, life's kind of pounding them a little bit. So find something that will help you get inspired and help you be happy. And inspiration helps you move forward and propels you. If you're inspired, you're energized. So, you know, let's replace that word. So get energized. What can you get energized about? I know when grant season comes along, I always used to get um, inspired and energized because I love writing grants. So that was something where I could use my creativity. Number 19, you know, I'm talking about getting energized, but on the flip side of that, we also want to slow down. It's important to stop and smell the roses, as they say, because you can miss things. When I went on my run um, day before yesterday, I didn't have much time, so I just went running in my neighborhood, which is usually kind of blasé. But that day, I happened to see five deer, two bunny rabbits, a squirrel, and a family full of geese. Well, that was cool. So I was slowing down enough to notice and pay attention to what was going on around me. When I was in the garden the other day harvesting, yeah, I was, you know, harvesting stuff, but I also took time to just stop and watch this bee go around and pollinate a bunch of my squash flowers, and I thanked him for it. But 
taking time to slow down and appreciate what already is is important instead of trying to say i will be happy when well why don't we just say i am happy now because you know life's never going to be perfect but what things do you have in your life that you can be happy for number 20 treat yourself as you treat others y'all know i've talked about this a lot a lot of times you are your own worst critic and you are harshest on yourself and you say horrible things to yourself well why treat yourself as you treat other people and you'll be a lot happier if you have compassion with others have compassion for yourself if you are dedicated towards making others happy guess what make yourself happy and it, it's easy to do it's really not that hard to do if you're in touch with what makes you happy most of us it doesn't take a lot to make us happy i mean to make us deliriously happy forever in the long term yeah that's difficult nobody's happy all the time but to make you happy for a moment you know for me it's easy as going on um, Amazon uh, music and listening to some comedians or going on YouTube and watching animal videos. You know, it's not hard for me to have a happy moment. Happy moments, you know, one or two add up, you know, and you want to have happy moments throughout the day. A body in motion tends to stay in motion and a body at rest tends to stay at rest. But if your body in motion is headed down a negative path, we really don't want to go there that's using a lot of energy that is not helping you get towards your rich and meaningful life so you want to have your body in motion going towards using that energy to go towards what is important in your rich and meaningful life so what is it that you want to use your energy for number 22 have an attitude of gratitude and you know that's a variation on some things we've already talked about but keeping a gratitude journal each day you know i'm grateful that i woke up i'm grateful that everybody's healthy i'm grateful that you know and try to add something to it every single day and it can be you know really random stuff like i'm grateful that i didn't ac accidentally back into that car when i was pulling out of the parking space or whatever it is um Focus on those little things that you usually overlook or take for granted. Along with gratitude, have faith. And faith is difficult. But you can start out with having faith in yourself. Faith in yourself to make the right decisions. Faith in yourself to do the next right thing. And then start working towards faith in other people. Now, that doesn't mean have faith in everybody else all the time. No. But most of us, have some friends have some people in our life that we can have faith in we can trust that when they say they're going to do something they do it we can have faith that they will have our back so start having faith in yourself and your and others and if you have a higher power well even even better i love num number 24 learn something daily I try to learn something daily um, and it doesn't have try to learn something fun you know you can read the news and learn things but that's not really fun um, try to learn something that that you care about you know whether it's companion planting for organic gardening or um, Let's see how to store winter squash or whatever it is obviously i just finished planting season so that's kind of where my head has been but find something that you can learn about daily number 25 is ask for help it can be hard to be happy when you are totally exhausted all the time because you refuse to ask for help most of the time people are happy to give help especially if you're not like constantly asking for help from them but think about it when somebody asks for your help do you feel put upon or do you feel glad that you're able to be of service now again asking for help it's a give and take it's a balancing act we don't want to be asking for help from people all the time and then not giving any back but as long as there's a give and take asking for help can help take some of the 
um, burden off of your own shoulders. And you know what? Sometimes when life is really going rocky, you may need to ask for a lot of help. And that's okay. Because when you're having a better time, you're probably going to be able to provide a lot more help to people. Um, so, you know, it is that give and take. Number 26, rejection or redirection? What do you want to call it? And uh, Jacqueline Pirtle talks about um, rejection as the universe having your back and redirecting you. And I did really like that phrase or, or concept that she presented. When something happens, when we get rejected, we don't get a job we're supposed to get. We don't get that house that we bid on. We, you know, don't end up in a relationship with somebody we wanted to. Is that rejection or is that the universe going, yeah, no, you're not supposed to go down that way. You know, the universe may know better. The, you know, if you can embrace that concept. And even if you don't think the universe knows better, if you're rejected, there ain't nothing you can do about it. You know, it's not like you can go, well, you can't reject me. Well, they can and they did. So when you get rejected, use that instead of getting angry about it, use that as redirection to figure out what to do instead. It's like, okay, that door shut, ain't going in there. What can I do instead? Which of these other doors should I try to open? 27 is curiosity. And this kind of goes with learning something daily. Be curious about things. You know, look around. Try to tap into your inner three-year-old. You know, that three-year-old that said, why is the sky blue? Why do clouds get gray before it rains? Why does the dog bark? You know, when you're an adult and the kid is asking you that, you know, 50,000 barrage of questions, it can get old, but they're curious. And that wide open curiosity, wanting to understand how things work, are so, is so awesome. I just finished binge watching a series called Perception on Hulu. And the, the main character in it was a, a neuroscientist. And he would bring up concepts when he was teaching in his lectures that I found fascinating. And I was like, oh, let me go research that and see if that's actually for real. And, you know, I spend a lot of time, even during my free time, looking at journal articles, but that's okay because I'm curious. I'm curious at how the mind works. I'm curious at what makes people tick and what makes people happy. Um, so, you know, wherever your curiosity lies, tap into it. When you get angry, Thank it. And you're like, excuse me? Well, you know, if you watch the video on anger management that I did a few months back, you'll understand where I'm coming from here. Anger and anxiety, pretty much all of our emotions, is our brain's kind of knee-jerk reaction based on the information it has to a certain situation. So if your body tells you to get angry or anxious, that is your body going, uh, hello, there may be a threat. It's like your fire alarm. It might be faulty, but it's going off and it's telling you you need to get up and do something. So thank your amygdala. Say, great, there, there may be a threat. Thank you for warning me. Let me check it out. It doesn't mean you have to get angry. It means you need to check it out. And that was good. You know, just like when your fire alarm goes off, you know, especially if it's a real fire, you, you are really grateful that you actually changed those batteries. 29 is authenticity. To be happy, we need to be authentic. That means living in concert with our own values, beliefs, ideas, not being what other people want us to be, but being who we are and being true to ourselves. That is hard. You know, that's one of those that's, you know, may not even fall in the easy-ish category. But you can try. And learning to develop effective cognitive and emotional boundaries can help you become more authentic. So you feel comfortable saying, you know what, I disagree, but that's okay. You know, we can have different opinions or different thoughts about something. It doesn't mean you're a bad person or I'm a bad person. It just means we have different opinions. And that's kind of what's important to make the world go round. Number 30, create a drama-free zone. Drama is exhausting, you know, and whether it's drama between your two teenage children or <laughs> drama with your spouse or drama at work, drama is exhausting. So create this drama-free zone somewhere 
in your life, whether it's in your house, you got a room that you can go to and there's just no drama allowed or outside, you know, maybe you have a certain corner of your yard where you go and people know not to come and bring all kinds of craziness when you're in that zone. That's your place to go and relax, decompress. Number 31 is interesting, decluttering emotions. Now, a lot of times when we have unpleasant emotions, one of the things that we do is compartmentalize it. We box it up. You know, this is unpleasant. I'm not going to deal with it right now. Box it up, put it back. Something else happens, unpleasant. Box it up, put it back. So before long, our mental attic is cluttered as can be. So one of the things that can help, and in order to, well, let me back up. That attic is cluttered, and it takes a whole lot of energy to shut that door anymore. And, you know, if you've ever had a closet like that where you've got to put your whole body weight against it to get it to shut, that's what we're talking about. When we have unpleasant emotions and unresolved stuff that we're holding on to, there is this undercurrent of energy that's required to keep it all boxed up. And keep that door shut so one of the ways to be happy is to free up that energy by decluttering your emotions go through and figure out okay this is guilt yeah this is something I can take care of I don't need to be holding on to this guilt this is anger this is something that I got really angry about but holding on to resentment about it 15 years later ain't doing me any good so I'm gonna figure out how to get rid of that now I say that like it's easy each one of those emotions, each one of those boxes that you go through, you've got to acknowledge what caused the emotion, whether it is helpful to continue to feel badly about that emotion, and generally the answer is no. Um, and, you know, if there's something that still needs to be done to resolve that situation, what are you going to do to deal with it so you can finally take that box and put it in recycling? Decluttering emotions is huge. You will feel like the weight of the world's been lifted. One of the things that I have my clients do when they take their inventory of guilt, griefs, and resentments, so they're decluttering their emotions, they write each issue on a different index card. And one, they pick one each day, and they figure out what they're going to do about it. And before long, they, they're starting to feel stronger and more empowered and more positive about themselves. Number 32, closing the season. And you know, sometimes things happen. We don't anticipate to lose somebody that's important to us. We don't anticipate to change jobs. We don't anticipate things that happen. And there are hiccups in our storyline. It's not how we in, had envisioned our life playing out if you want to view yourself as a, a television series so when i talk about closing the season or if you're thinking about a book closing the chapter your storyline all of a sudden has taken a hard right turn you know for whatever reason so how can you close that out close that chapter out and what is the next chapter or the next season going to look like um one show i watch blue bloods in the middle of, or like right at the end of the season, before the next season started, one of their main characters evidently quit. And they picked up the next season, and she was already gone, and they had to figure out how to write that in so the rest of us could kind of catch up with, okay, what happened here, and how are we going to make sense of it? So think of your life as a television series or a book, and when something happens that changes the storyline or adds to it, you know, that is a plot change. That's it. And narrate how it's going to be different henceforth and forevermore. Number 33, respect. Well, Aretha Franklin wrote a great song about it. You need to respect yourself. Respect your ideas. Respect your feelings. Respect your wants and needs. Respect other people. How awesome would it feel to be able to just respect other people? Now, you don't have to love their behaviors, but if we respect them, it can make us a lot happier. Now, this, you know, this is one of those trauma-informed areas that gets a little bit hinky sometimes. Um, so I encourage you to 
focus on respecting the people that you can. You know, if there are people in your life that, you know, you're just like, I can't respect them. All right. You know, let's focus on the majority of the other people. Embrace the dialectics of life. Well, life has good and bad. It's rainy. Well, okay, it's rainy outside. Some people could see that as horrible. What are the benefits of the rain? You know, so try to balance the positives and negatives. And remember, you want to try to have five positives for every negative. So, you know, try to look at what might be going on that's helpful in addition to the fact that, you know, part of it, part of it sucks. Um, I had my phone stolen last week and, you know, that was really unpleasant and unnerving to me, but, and, and I don't like spending money. So, you know, I had to buy another phone, which was also very unpleasant and unnerving to me. True. But I'm going to have a phone that has a better camera and it's going to be a newer phone and it'll last longer because my other one, you know, was older. You know, so trying to embrace the dialectics of what happened instead of being stuck in being poochy about it. Um, and, and don't get me wrong. I had my poochy moment. Um, but when I woke up the next morning, I was like, you know what? It's not worth my energy to stay upset about this because staying upset is not doing any good. So what positives are going to come out of this? Number 35, empathy, not pity. Sorry, not sorry. When something happens to other people, you can have empathy for them, which means, you know, I see that this is really awful right now and I'm there with you, versus pity where you feel really bad for them. And it's a semantic difference. Um, empathy is like strapping on repelling gear and going down into a dark well with somebody who's stuck down there. So you're experiencing something kind of similar to what they're experiencing, and you're like, all right, I'm here with you. Pity or sympathy is standing at the top and looking down going, hmm, that must be really awful. Well, why do we want to have empathy, not sympathy, or empathy, not pity? If you believe that everything that happens is an opportunity or the universe redirecting you, then why would you be sorry that somebody's getting the opportunity to grow or get redirected? Yes, it's a semantic change. It doesn't mean you have to be happy about it and go, yeah, hey, you know, you really got the tar beat out of you on that one. So, you know, I guess something better must be coming your way. But what we do want to do is remember that while this person may be struggling and it may be really difficult right now, helping them embrace whatever changes are coming can be helpful. And the same thing for yourself. When something happens bad in your life, you know, have empathy for yourself. And instead of sitting on your pity pot going, oh, poor me, empathize and go, you know what? This really sucks right now. And I deserve to be upset about it. However, this is a learning opportunity or this is a redirection that I, can, I will somehow take advantage of. Number 36, remember who you are. And this kind of goes along with authenticity. Just remembering what you stand for is really important. And doing the things that are in concert with your values. When you do things that go against your values or your beliefs or even your wants, it feels unpleasant. When you remember who you are and you do things that are in line with who you are, you'll feel better. You'll feel lighter. 37 is to communicate clearly with self and others. Why self and others? You, you talk to yourself? Yeah. <laughs> we talk to ourselves all the time. We may not talk out loud to ourselves, but we do talk to ourselves. And in order to communicate clearly, we have to be mindful. We have to know what it is that we want and how it is we think we should go about getting it. You know, we're, we need to give ourselves some direction. And then, you know, most of the time, we're not going to do it all by ourselves. We need to communicate clearly with other people. If we expect other people to read our mind, we're going to be sadly disappointed. If we communicate clearly with others about our wants and needs, most likely those people that are important in our life are going to care and they're going to try to help us achieve that, which is going to make us happy. So mind reading, 
disappointment, unhappy, clear communication, fulfillment, happy. Makes perfect sense. Number 38 is serenity. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So one of the things that keeps people unhappy is trying to change things they can't. And one of the things that we can't change is other people. You know, if you try to change somebody, you know, you might modify their behavior a little bit, but you're probably not going to be really successful in changing a lot of people unless they want to change themselves. So accepting the things you cannot change, the weather, other people, you know, the fact that time passes, there are just things that are. So accepting those radically and going, it is what it is, changing the things you can. If you don't like the way your life is headed right now, well, look at what parts of it can you change? What can you do to get you headed back towards your rich and meaningful life? Thought garden. Now, this one's kind of fun. Um, you can either do it symbolically or you can actually plant a garden. Um, one of the things I do with my clients is when they're unhappy, I encourage them to plant a thought garden. And every day or every week, they plant a flower or a plant that reminds them of something happy that happened that day or that week. So before long, they've got, you know, this beautiful garden patch with flowers in it that remind them of the happiness and the happy times that they had over the past month or six months or whatever it is. Now, you can do it symbolically, too, by remembering that the thoughts that you plant in your own mind are going to grow. So if you're planting negative thoughts, guess what's going to grow? If you're planting happy thoughts, you know, guess what's going to grow? So make sure to work every day on planting happy thoughts in your mind. Try to find happy things. Make a concerted effort to find the happy in things. And if you find yourself, you know, getting ready for a meeting that you're going to, going, oh my gosh, this is going to be the worst four hours of my life, you know, reframe that. You know, plant a thought garden thought that this four hours is four hours I don't have to be doing paperwork because I'm going to be in a meeting. Um, try to reframe it in a way that's positive in order to plant those positive thoughts. And finally, number 40 is progressive relaxation. And you can do progressive muscular relaxation. If you go online, you can find a lot of scripts on YouTube where somebody's narrating progressive muscular relaxation. But progressive relaxation is even simpler. You breathe in for a count of four. You feel the air filling up your belly and your chest. And you breathe out for a count of four. And you feel the air leaving, but you also feel the tension leaving your body with each and every breath. And then you breathe in and you breathe out and you feel the tension leaving again. And your body gets progressively heavier and heavier and more relaxed and more relaxed. I know with my dogs, I shouldn't do it. It's not nice, but whatever. When they're asleep, I'll go over and I'll pick up their little paws and they'll just like drop right back down like, you know, lead weights. That's being really totally relaxed. So progressive muscular relaxation or progressive relaxation can help you activate those relaxation chemicals that go with rest and digest and can help you feel happy, less anxious, and less angry. Okay, I told you that Sark had a lot of similarities to um, Jacqueline Pirtle's book, and it does. Hers are written, obviously, very um, creatively, but they have a lot of wonderful, wonderful, awesome recovery activities in them. So Succulent Wild Woman, um, Dancing with Your Wonderful Self, this is obviously, obviously more geared towards self-esteem and self-esteem enhancement. Eat Mangoes Naked, Finding Pleasure Everywhere and Dancing with the Pits. This is more on your dialectical behavior therapy and dealing with life on life's terms and accepting being happy despite the fact that, you know, sometimes there's bumps in the road. And Transformation Soup, Healing for the Splendidly Imperfect. And 
you know, this kind of covers the gamut of things from guilt and bad relationships to recognizing that even though you're imperfect, you are perfectly lovable. So Sark has a lot of awesome books out there that you can um, tap into. Uh, 365 Days of Happiness by Jacqueline Pirtles, another great one. It's not quite as colorful, but it does give you just very concise activities that you can do every day. There are many techniques for helping you live happier. So you've got to find what works for you. Maybe you're like me and you're more cognitive and you like to, you know, make bullet points and lists and whatever. Maybe you're like Sark and you like to do things that are more creative and inspiring. Maybe you're like Jacqueline Pirtle and you like to have those inspiring moments, but a little bit every day. Whatever it is that works for you, that works into your life to help you live happier, is going to improve your quality of life. If you like our podcast, you can join our Facebook group at docsnipes.com slash Facebook, or you can subscribe to Doc's, um, Happiness Isn't Brain Surgery on your favorite podcast app, or join our community at docsnipes.com. See you next Sunday.